Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, today, I am honored to uh, speak to Mustafa Akyol, who is a Turkish writer residing in Washington, DC. Uh, he's a fellow at the Cato Institute and the author of the excellent book, The Islamic Jesus, uh, How the King of the Jews Became a Prophet of the Muslims, published by St. Martin's Press, and I will link to it in the description below. You are most welcome, Mustafa. Uh, thank you so much, Paul. Uh, I've, uh, I'm very thankful for this conversation and also for some of the videos you already put out about my book. So I was very happy and honored to hear your views about it. And I look forward to speaking today. Thank you again. Fantastic. Well, you're most welcome. Um, and I love the fact that you had each chapter of this uh, book with a penetrating quote. Uh, for example, in the, uh, your introduction uh, begins with a quote from the American New Testament scholar Jeffrey J. Butts, who writes, James can serve as a desperately needed missing link between the children of Abraham. James can serve as a desperately needed missing link between the children of Abraham. And in this introductory chapter, Mustafa tells us how he read a copy of the New Testament given him by a missionary in Istanbul, his home city, and how this led to his discovery of the important historical figure of James, who was the brother of Jesus. Little known, perhaps, uh, that he was actually the brother of Jesus. So, Mustafa, could you kindly explain why James matters so much for our understanding of Jesus and why he can be described as a much-needed missing link? Mm -hmm. uh, sure, Paul. Thanks for starting from there. Um, first of all, I should maybe see that why I like the term the, the children of Abraham. Um, I do, I, I'm a Muslim myself, alhamdulillah, as we would say it, but I do believe in this monotheistic uh, history and legacy uh, in, in the world. And uh, Islam as a historical religion began in, you know, uh, early 7th century Arabia. But when I look back at monotheists from 3,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, I say, well, these are our people. We are walking the same path. And of course, this history is has Judaism at its very beginnings. Uh, well, historically, probably goes beyond that, but as historically what we know. And of course, with Christianity, it takes a very universalistic message. But Christianity brings some elements to it, like the divine Christ, you know, triune God, which is... Uh, for Jews and Muslims, not that acceptable. And then we are, uh, then, then Islam comes. So there's this, in, in, although there is this one monotheistic tree, there are branches of it. And of course, I consider Christianity as monotheistic too, but the definition of God there complicates things. Now, uh, uh, my book begins, this is a book about Jesus, as you said, but it begins with James, James the Just. Why? Uh, as you said, few people actually would know who he is. Even yeah. many Christians would may, vaguely know the name James the Just, but it's, he's not much emphasized. And probably Muslims don't know at all. Many, many Muslims mm -hmm. don't know. Well, of course, James is the anglicized version of the original name, which is Yaakov, which in Islam and Arabic we would call Yaqub. Right? So it's a familiar name for us. And as we learn from the New Testament itself, James was one of the brothers of Jesus. Now, when you say this, some people can say, how could Jesus have brothers? Because Mary was, of course, a virgin. Well, yeah. yes, that's what we Muslims believe and what Christians believe too. But according to an interpretation, he is called, after Jesus, Mary married. Actually, he was, you know, uh, already uh, engaged with this man uh, called uh, Yusuf and uh, Joseph. And after Jesus, who came to, to the world with divine, uh, as a divine miracle without a father, but she yeah. then had a normal life and she had a family and she had several children. Right. One thing is that Catholics, because they believe in the perpetual uh, virginity of Mary, they actually didn't feel comfortable with that. And some Catholics explain that as actually they were not the brothers, but they were the cousins, maybe, you know, they were called yeah. figuratively brothers. So there is that interpretation. But but if you leave that aside, if you read the New Testament, you would think that, oh, um, I mean, Jesus has a family that's <laughs> brothers and uh, amazing. 
So, and James is, James is the elder brother. And he shows up in the New Testament. I mean, he's referred to a few times. Uh, but then there is a uh, there is a letter written by James, mm. the letter of James. It is very, towards the very end. It's very short. And uh, my book begins with the story of me, as you said. Uh, it was a year 2000 or 2001, uh, 20 years ago. Uh, I was doing my you know, master's in Istanbul. I got this Injil or Evangelion or like New Testament from a Christian missionary. And actually, you know, I knew certain things about Christianity, but that was the first time I actually I, uh, got into it. And as a Muslim, you know, I looked at New Testament as a Muslim. And any Muslim who does that, I think, in the, uh, looks into New Testament will find passages that we will love and will inspire us deeply. These are very good, very great teachings about ethics, morality, and godliness and faith. But then there will be passages you will say, no, 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 <laughs> well, no, 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 we, we don't say that. You know, we don't think that, you know, Jesus is the son of God in, 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 in the sense that he is divine. But letter of James, although he mentions Lord Jesus Christ in the beginning, just one line, is different from the passages of the New Testament that really focuses on Jesus as a divine figure. It rather focuses on piety. It's about being steadfast in the observance of God, which is a very Jewish idea and an Islamic idea. Exactly. So the emphasis and, there is not based on what you must believe that theology is about practice. It's about being doing good works. There's this a sense of being a good person and doing righteous deeds. Very, as you say, very yeah. Jewish, very Islamic, not, not so much Christian. There's emphasis on you know having the right theology and the right beliefs and the right creed and that really being a very important difference. Uh -huh. yeah. Now, uh, of course, the fact that the, the, the very term Lord Jesus Christ appears in the first line has led uh, many Christians to say, well, I mean, he's this is a proper Christian document. He's just emphasizing uh, an aspect which we also accept in Christianity, being pious and moral. And that's one way of looking into it. And I respect that point of view. But then there's another way of looking into this. While all the letters of Paul, many letters, there are also before the letter of James, there are so many, 13 letters of Paul. The, the, there's a huge emphasis there on what we call Christology, like the crucifixion of Jesus, the way it was meant to uh, be a vehicle for salvation of humanity. So that divine Christ idea is there. Well, well, it's not in James. So what, what it's, he, it's not emphasized there. The, so one way is to say these are different emphases in the same broad Christian uh, founding tradition, uh, the founders of Christianity. Another way of looking at it is, is that, well, James perceived Jesus actually a bit differently than Paul. He was still a Jew. He was a practicing Jew. His his fellow, uh, actually, first Christians, if you will, were also Jews. And we know that, I mean, historically, it's true. And, uh, and so this is one thing. And then when you look into the early uh, history of early Christianity, you see these people calling themselves, well, they're not calling themselves, historians call themselves Jewish Christians. And these were pious, observant Jews who accepted Jesus as the Messiah in the Jewish sense of the term, which is different from Christ in the Christian sense of the term. And they revere James. They see Ju James as their uh, sheikh or you know, as their leader. Uh, whereas they don't like Paul. So you see that, like, that, that's a historical fact that there were people like that. Yeah. So my book begins with this and asks the question, could there be a strain in early Christianity that is actually resonant with Islamic beliefs? Islamic beliefs about Jesus, per se, plus the general Islamic theology of faith in God, monotheism, piety, and acts. Yeah. Uh, and uh, my book begins with this question and just, you know, looks into the early history of Christianity, then comes to the birth of Islam, what the Quran teaches about uh, Jesus and how it uh, resonates very remarkably with Jewish Christianity. So you're saying that James then was a Torah observant Jew um, who, who, after Jesus left the scene, ascended into heaven, um, was the head of the church, or the, uh, the sheikh, as you put it, or the, the bishop of Jerusalem, which was the center of gravity in the church at that time. After all, that's where, the, where Jesus uh, lived. That's where the apostles continued to live for a time. And he was the head of the church, uh, the head of the congregation of the disciples of Jesus, elected or appointed by them, according to our sources. But he 
his his theology, his beliefs, his way of living was quite different in many ways from that of Paul and the Hellenistic Christians. For example, about the law, the Sharia, the Halakha, if you like, uh, Paul, at least many of his followers, believed that he advocated the abolition of the law, the obsolescence of the law, or that it was the old covenant. But James, uh, who obviously was the brother of Jesus, you, you don't get much closer than that, apart from being his mm -hmm. mother, I suppose, mm -hmm. um, very much continued to be what we would call an Orthodox Jew, a Torah observant yeah. Jew. And this yeah. is a, wow, you know, th this is a mind blowing revelation. And this is based on uh, very good sources. And one of the good things, uh, one of the many good things about this book is um, you are very familiar with um, the relevant biblical scholarship on the subject. Um, I've got a list here. You, it's very impressive. You cite, among other people, James Tabor, uh, is all professors, by the way, uh, and specialists in this field, Robert Eisenman, Giza Vermesh, Jimmy Dunn, and Richard Balkum. I think the first three, the first two are American, Giza Vermesh is British, and so are Jimmy Dunn and Richard Balkum. And you have a very good grasp of the primary historical sources. So that's the Bible and the so-called apocryphal sources and other sources, some of which are really obscure. and I certainly hadn't heard of some of them. So I think the book is an excellent resource for Muslims and others wishing to understand how Jesus came to be viewed uh, in mm -hmm. Islam. But mm -hmm. but but, but you, you, I agree with you that historically speaking, James is the key to understanding his brother um, and that James didn't see his brother, Jesus, as mm -hmm. uh, the second person of the Trinity. Would you agree that he didn't see him as the Trinity, a second person of the Trinity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what, one thing, uh, I should also add that the letter of James was disliked by some prominent Christians. Yeah, uh, one of them was uh, uh, Luther, and he, he he called it epistle uh, epistle straw epistle. Epistle and, straw. That's epistle right. straw, and he actually thought it should not have been in the New Testament. So it's it's a little different line yeah. compared to the letter of. Uh, Letter of uh, letters of Paul. Plus, when we read the Acts of the Apostles, we already mm -hmm. see a tension historically between the line of Christianity opened by Paul and and the line of Christianity represented by James. Line of Judaism, <laughs> was, we saying maybe more accurate. And, yeah. and, and Acts already narr narrate this. I mean, although what it exactly means is th the question there is whether. Paul is preaching the message of Jesus to Gentiles. These are non-Jews. Um, and can you eat with them? That becomes an issue because Jews don't do that. You know, then uh, this becomes a dispute in Jerusalem. Paul is called upon. So you already see that there is some tension. So my book questions, could the tension be bigger? Or could the implications of the tension be greater for world history than we understand? Now, you mentioned something, Sharia, uh, and I think that's relevant to uh, some, many of our contemporary discussions. And indeed, I actually, I had this framework in my mind, if you will, while writing this book. Um, Judaism is a halakhic religion, and halakha is very much like the Sharia, right? Actually, you can say the Sharia is the Islamic version of the halakha. Yeah. One difference being that uh, Judaism didn't have a state for 2,000 years, so halakha became a communal law without a power of the state. So it just existed as a voluntary communal. Uh, so it's not the state law. In Islam, because of the long history of political power, Sharia and the state has been intertwined. So there is a historical difference. But yes, Islam. I see Islam and Judaism as basically very similar religions. Christianity being a little bit different from them in yeah. certain ways, in both theology and and also both approach to law. And as you said, Paul has taken the step of basically leaving Halakha be behind, right? That's mm -hmm. why that's why Christians uh, don't have circumcision or anything, all that observances. So, yeah. and to me, uh, that's one extreme. The other extreme is the approach of the Pharisees. I see Jesus criticizing in the New Testament. And I think those criticisms were valid and important. I think Jesus was calling for a better understanding of the Halakha with less rigidity on details and more emphasis on the spirit. So Jesus was a reformer of the Halakha, whereas 
Paul got away with the Holocaust. So, and there are different lines here. So there's strict Holocaustism, a reformist spiritual interpretation of the Holocaust, and then no Holocaust at all. And I certainly sympathize with the Jesus line here. And I think something like that is meaningful for Muslims today. Uh, before we come on back to that, because your concluding chapter in the book is entitled What Jesus Can Teach Muslims Today. And um, I know you want to talk about that. Before we come to that again, just to come back to James and Jesus uh, for mm -hmm. the moment. So we've established, I think, quite reasonably, and I mentioned some of the scholars, very uh, distinguished uh, academics um, in Britain and America uh, that you reference. Um, uh, some of them, sadly, Giza Vermish and Jimmy Dunn have now passed away. Um, and uh, a huge loss to, to biblical scholarship. But uh, the point being, though, that um, having said that, and having said that Islam and Judaism are very similar, it is the historical portrait of Jesus that you uh, that you outline. How does that relate to what the Quran says about Jesus? I think that's what I'm trying to say. Are they very similar? Uh, well, the Quran takes a, I think, middle position Hmm. between the teachings of Christianity and between the teachings of Judaism. I mean, in, in contemporary Judaism, in, in historical Judaism, you don't have a reference towards Jesus. I mean, Jesus is not, Jesus was a Jew, but probably a Jew that went, you know, astray, yeah. as, as some uh, historical yeah. uh, figures in Christian, uh, Judaism would say. And at best, he was a Jew with some uh, reformist ideas. And, and he's not, there's nothing, in it. he's not a prophet. He's not a messiah, right? Uh, whereas for Christians, Jesus is, of course, God incarnate, right? That is, I mean, that's, that's ma mainstream Christianity. Uh, Islam takes a middle position mm -hmm. and confirms and says, I mean, the Quran calls repeatedly Jesus Messiah. Right. Isa Messiah. Now, the Quran doesn't define what that means, but so therefore we have to learn what that means from the tradition that used it, right? Which is Judaism. And yeah. in Judaism, the Messiah, which Orthodox Jews are still awaiting, right, is, is this kind of redeemer that will come and save the people of Israel from oppression. Uh, that's people of Israel. I mean, not the citizens of the modern day of Israel, but people of Israel in terms of Jewish people from oppression, bring justice. And it's kind of a Mehdi-like figure mm -hmm. uh, in Islam. And uh, so that's an awaited figure. And the Quran repeatedly calls Jesus um, Messiah, that is Messiah. Uh, and the Quran also called Jesus, of course, a prophet of God. The Quran even calls Jesus, by the way, word of God, a word from God, which is interesting. And actually, it led to interesting intra, uh, interesting theological discussions between Christians and Muslims in, in the first centuries. Of just on that point, if I may, Mr. Fub, because the first chapter of John's Gospel, very famously and uniquely, and there's no other Gospel that says this, in the beginning was the word logos in Greek, meaning the rationality, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, it, of the universe, a kind of a stoic term from Greek philosophy, mm -hmm. but also resonates with Genesis one. You know, God created, God said, "Let there be light." So God spoke a word, mm -hmm. and creation came about. And Jesus identified with the word or uh, the word of God. But then the Quran also uses a similar term. But um, does it, it, it does it have that same stoic kind of resonance? That kind of philosophical meaning or does it have a the word of god you mean the term yeah well when jesus referred to as a word yeah. from god in the quran mm -hmm. uh again the quran just says in one passage one one verse and uh, it is hard to understand know what that exactly means but this yeah. leads us to of course questions about islamic theology about what kalamullah uh means right i mean the and for the Asharites, it was a uh, it was one of the sifats that was one of the properties of God. So actually, it coexists with God. So in actually in Islamic uh, theology, Ashari, the Asharites and their understanding of the Word of God resonates a little bit with the Gospel of John, although they would not go far as saying the Word is God, but was with God. Yes. Whereas the Mutazila, uh, one of the early actually the earliest school in Islam, precisely they re because the Mutezala realized that if we make this argument, then Christians can't say the same thing for Jesus. They said, no, no, the word of God is a created uh, being by God. So the Quran is created and Jesus is created, although they are words of God. So that's the Mutezala way of looking at it. And interestingly, this discussion began in Islam, according to some historians, 
because John of Damascus, a, a Christian theologian in, in uh, Damascus, asked to Muslims, well, you criticize us for thinking that Jesus was co-eternal, but don't you believe word of God is eternal and Jesus word of God according to your own book? And, you know, Muslims had to, uh, had to wrestle with this issue. Anyway, so that's it. But coming back to your original question, uh, Islam takes a middle view in the sense that it affirms Jesus was the Messiah and it, uh, he was a prophet. Also, the Quran confirms the virgin birth, which is dramatic. I mean, it's uh, it's the key one of the key features of Christianity. The Quran strongly affirms that. And actually, my book, I said today, um, some modernist Christians think that, you know, virgin birth is just a metaphor. It was not true and, you know, in the in the real sense yeah, actually right. overwhelming majority of muslims will insist the virgin birth was virgin birth right and we take it yeah. literally uh, on the other hand quran takes a very strong criticisms towards the idea that jesus is divine and can be worshipped as god or and, and takes a very strong position against the doctrine of tyranny so the quran very much i think resonates with what christians call sex with low christologies yeah. like the, the the Christology is the kind of philosophy about Jesus and Christ. I mean, uh, w w his the discussions about the nature of Christ. So high Christology means Christ was God. A low Christology was Christ was a ch somebody chosen and beloved by God and, and given a mission by God. So Islam resonates with that, which brings us to discussion. And I believe Islam is historically the continuation of the Jewish Christian line right yeah. Yeah, I, I, I the, to, the followers yeah. of jesus who were jews and who uh accept him honored him and followed them as yeah. christ but who did not worship him i just wanted to point out to, to viewers this is not some crazy muslim idea um it, it's actually an idea that is seriously entertained by the the highest some of the highest um catholic and other scholarly authority for example there's a a big fat tome i remember when i was at university uh, this was the new Jer new jerusalem biblical commentary um it weighs about uh four pounds anyway it's an official publication of the catholic church it's got an introduction by two cardinals it, it's you, you don't get much more uh, official than this and in that book um in in the its commentary uh on the whole bible there's a section on matthew's gospel and it actually says that uh, as pretty much what you say mustafa that jewish christianity as you described it uh was reborn as islam in the seventh century now they explicitly make this historical link Now, jewish christianity as we're calling it was the original faith of the disciples the original faith of james the brother of jesus and of jesus himself so that they even the catholic church has made this connection the beginning of your book you cite jeffrey butts who's a lutheran minister as well as a, a professor at uh at penn state university he makes that connection and so does james tabor i can go on and on so th this is an extraordinary extraordinary thing to to emphasize it's not just a, a muslim idea the highest some of the highest circles in the west in scholarship and in church circles have i recognized this point so mm -hmm. anyway exactly and i quoted by the way this issue i mean this connection this fascinating connection if you will was first studied by german scholars in the 19th century and i quote them in my book some of them i mean i myself don't read german sources in german but most of them are also now available in english and i uh, dig into that there's great scholarship there in, in, in first about the history of the early christianity but they said oh my god this is so similar to what islam says about jesus and uh, and in my book, I actually go back and forth between some of the apocryphal sources and how the Quran describes uh, Mary and Jesus and uh, uh, all, all, all the founding moment of Christianity. One, one nuance there, Paul, is this. Hmm. It is very clear, and I think no one will doubt, that Jewish Christians who are known in Christian sources as Ebionites and Nazarenes have a belief very similar to that of Islam. I mean, and they were Jewish Christians who lived in the second, third century. And we know from of them mainly from the church fathers. Yeah. Church fathers wrote about this heresies of Christianity, like some of our you know, scholars wrote about the uh, heresies in our tradition. The heresiology uh, has a long history in uh, every tradition. So they said, oh, there are these people who call themselves Christians, but they're actually Jews and they don't worship Jesus. 
they don't like Paul, but they like uh, they, they yeah. follow James. Mm -hmm. For those church fathers and for the mainstream Christian tradition, this Jewish Christianity was a misunderstanding of the early church. So yeah. they are making that argument. I, I, we should give that. Uh, another way of seeing this is that these Jewish Christian heretics were actually following the original uh, belief that we James the Just was representing. Yep. The, uh, how, it is not possible to prove any of these points of view, but I just gave the literature on this issue. And as a Muslim, I have my sympathies, you know, for the for the argument that these Christians, this uh, Ebionites and Nazarenes, represented the early teaching. You can make that argument. I tried to, you know, put the evidence for that argument. Others say. This happened as a later, the later Juda, Judaization, you know, in Christianity. So yes. That's one view. I, I mean, I'm just uh, to be fair. We should say that. Uh, also, I think some uh, Christian theologians argue that the nature of Jesus was so overwhelming that it wasn't even easily recognized by all the first disciples. Right. So that's the, that's the other way they explain. Like, like the, the truth unfolded gradually in time. So there is that argument. I My sympathies are clear there, but I, I just wanted to say that there are different ways of looking at this. But what is quite amazing is that Ebionites, as we understand from their own documents and from uh, like the Dake and, and also from what is written about them by church fathers, has a view of Jesus, and basically monotheism, very similar to that of Islam. Now, once you put there, then you come to the question, oh, how is it possible that these people disappeared in the 5th century, because we don't hear anything about them after the 5th century. Yep. How did people disappear, and if how how is it possible that their theology got reborn uh, two centuries in a little different part of the world? I mean, similar, but... So that that's that's the title of the missing link, you know. Uh, right. Okay. Chapter in my book. Yeah. So we got the missing link there. I I, I just I as I say, every uh, chapter of your book has some very juicy quotes. So I'm going to quote one now. Uh, chapter four, the missing link. Uh, it's by a guy called uh, Hans Joachim Schoeps. I probably mispronounced that. German scholar, religious historian, and philosopher. He's one of the German scholars I mentioned, yeah, yeah. Exactly. He's a very, very senior scholar in the 20th century. I like his quote. Now, this guy's not a Muslim, of course. Here is a paradox of world historical proportions. So get ready for it. Jewish Christianity indeed disappeared within the Christian church, but was preserved in Islam. Wow. So Jewish Christianity basically disappeared and was reborn or, or reoccurred in Islam. And he calls that a paradox of world historical proportions because the paradox being is that Islam is seen as completely alien and other to Western Christians. And yet it is extremely similar to the original Christian faith, which became, as you just said, Mustafa, anathematized and treated as heretical as early as the second century, where uh, people like Justin Martyr, uh, sorry, Ignatius of Antioch uh, and others, specifically targeted Jewish Christians for criticism and saying, look, you can't be a Jew, either be a Christian or a Jew. You can't be both as if Jesus himself wasn't a Jew. You know, I mean, it's, it's quite extraordinary. Um, Indeed, yeah. uh, Paul, thanks. And I'm honored by the fact that you read these quotes from my book. Thank you. And so let me read one another book from my quote that is very relevant. The one yeah. that's at the very beginning of the book. Oh, yeah. uh, it's by John Toland. Who, by the way, is the first probably European who wrote about this? And uh, I, I begin one chapter with him, and he said in he has this book Nazarene Nazarenius, or Jewish Gentile and Mahometan Christianity, like mm -hmm. Mahometan meaning Islamic, basically, right? The, and the year and the place it was published, you got London, 18, uh, 18, 1718, so early 18th century in London, and he says. What Mahometans, that is again a not accurate term, but Muslims, let's say, what Muslims believe concerning Christ and his doctrine were not the inventions of Muhammad, but they were as old as the time of the apostles, having been the sentiments of whole sects or churches. 
Uh, so, so there were what he says is that what Islam says about Jesus that he was Messiah, he was a prophet of God, he was blessed, he had miracles, he had he had divine birth. But you should not worship him; you should rather, you know, honor him. And he was worshiping God; he was not God himself. This was there, and of course, we see this in Jewish Christianity. You can even make the case that Arianism, which is which went in history as a heresy, said something similar to this, although you know maybe elevated Christ one more step. Yeah. Um, yeah. And of course, this line in Christianity would be reborn in the pro, during the Protestant Reformation. The strain we know as Unitarianism, and I'll come to that later in the book, was also uh, a revival of this idea, which had roots in the very beginning. So we come to this very interesting scene that. A certain strain in early Christianity, which didn't define mainstream Christianity, is very much on the same path with Islam as a theology. Uh, and how was this possible? Uh, I mean, in the Missing Link chapter, I discuss uh, the evidence. Some people, I mean, some people notice this and actually they're proving. And actually, one of the most remarkable articles on this issue was by the late Patricia Crone. Oh, yeah. Um, Oh, uh, yes, that quote. Yes, I'm glad you mentioned yeah, that. I actually <laughs> quoted her. I mean, I, I noticed the article. It came yeah, yeah. almost when I was finishing the book. And uh, Patricia Crone was, I mean, a great scholar. She was very knowledgeable about Islam. Her early thesis about Hagarism was a fantasy which luckily got, uh, you know, disproven. And because uh, she herself retreated from that idea. But she knew a lot about Islam. And in I think in the very last article of hers, before she passed away, it's this big, like a book, like an article, like two, two. Uh, for, she actually gets into this Jewish Christianity and Islam connection, and uh, what she's trying to show, as the other German scholars I mentioned, is how is it possible? Okay, these things are incredibly similar, Jewish Christianity and Islam. How Muhammad learned this, right? That's that's their question. Yeah, and so there's a big effort to. Was there a Jewish community? Could they have survived for two centuries? There are some rock inscriptions in Negev. So do they give us a hint about, the, like, is there a surviving Jewish Christian yeah. strain? And I go all that in my book and I say, well, there is really no clear evidence to say that a Jewish Christian community survived. You can, you can hypothesize that if you believe yeah. that there must be a historical connection or you can just... You can take two other views, which is you can believe in a platonic archetype saying that different theologies are reborn without historical connections with each other because these things happen. And also you can believe in what we Muslims believe, which is what Prophet Muhammad received revelation from God. So he, he received the knowledge about Jesus from Gabriel. Of course, that's what that's not a. That's not what the secular scholarship will accept here, but you can very well have that faith as very compatible with the historical reality uh, we see. Uh, but you, you, you reference, a, if I'm not mistaken, a particular um, point that Patricia Crone makes about um, the way the early Christians were historically designated uh, and, and the way the Quran refers to them as well. And, and she refers to this as an extraordinary uh, fact that the Quran gets it seemingly precisely right in a yeah. way you would not expect a seventh yeah. century Arab to get yeah, right. She says, that. In fact, yeah. what, what, she says something. I mean, for anybody who loves my book or likes my book, and you know, if you want to read something after than this from a non Muslim author, I'll, I'll say check Patricia Crone's article on this. Uh, yes, thank you again. First, read my book. That's probably better. But you know, her, her article was good, very good too. Uh, of course, she, her article is wrote, written from a totally secular point of view. And one thing she says is, uh, it is remarkable. She says that the Quran says Jesus was sent to the children of Israel, the Jews, and she says a seventh century Arab prophet could have easily thought that. Moses is sent to Jews and Jesus is sent to Christians. No, Jesus is sent to Jews. That's what the Quran is saying. So, and of course, Christianity came out of that. But the people who speak Jesus spoke to were not Romans. They were not, 
North Americans, right? They were fellow Jews he was speaking to. And she just mentions this as a remarkable fact that, you know, Prophet Muhammad had this, of course, he th she thinks the Quran is Prophet Muhammad's words, not, not revelation. That's what she thinks. But she says, it's remarkable that the messenger says this. So she has very good insights, actually, on this, which is a culmination of the scholarship. I mean, she just didn't create all this, but she's one of the scholars, I think, who got into this very interesting connection. I think, I think the point is a very nuanced one, and, and maybe it will go over the heads of a lot of people. But if you're kind of immersed in the history and the language and so on, it really is a significant point. And, and for Mohammed, so to speak, allegedly to get it right, is a, a pretty lucky guess uh, on one view, or which is more credible that obviously he was given that information from another source, uh, meaning from God himself. But um, no, th th thanks for that. Um, I, I did promise that we would look at your concluding chapter of your book, uh, The Islamic Jesus. Um, which is entitled, as I said, What Jesus Can Teach Muslims Today. C can you explain what that might be? Sure. Sure. In my book, I spend a lot of time and I focus on the theology around Jesus, right? There are different theologies. Uh, there's a chapter, Islamic Christology, uh, how that resonates and compares to Christianity. It's, it's, a, it's all about how we understand the nature of Jesus. But then there's something else, the teachings of Jesus. And I say, whatever we, whatever Christology we may have, or if it can be a secular person who doesn't believe in any of that, one can say, okay, what Jesus was preaching, let's look into that. Uh, and there I find the teachings of Jesus that we find in the New Testament. I mean, there are teachings of Jesus that we see in the Quran, but the Quran Here's one thing that, first of all, I take as a guiding principle. The Quran calls on Muslims to refer to the existing uh, previous books. That is why our early scholars developed a tradition called Israeliyat. You know, you go and learn from the Jews because, you know, they, and that is because the Quran, for example, mentions Ayyub in just words. I mean, just in passing, you don't. You wouldn't understand much, but there's a whole chapter there in the Old Testament, right? In the Christian, uh, in the Jewish uh, scripture. So I, first of all, take the idea that whatever is thought about Jesus in the New Testament can inform us Muslims. We will have certain, you know, guards against some of the teachings there. And, and I actually show that the New Testament can be read without accepting the you know divinity of Jesus, especially the Gospels. I mean, letters of Paul or something else. Um, so what are these teach what those teachings of Jesus in the New Testament are? Uh, that's one like let's say principle first I defend before studying the uh, ideas of Jesus. Secondly, I say historically, uh, we Muslims, the Ummah, the Islamic community in the world today, is in a situation a bit similar to the time of Jesus. And the person who made this argument was the great historian Arnold Toynbee. Hmm. Uh, Arnold Toynbee, towering historian of the 20th century, wrote this very interesting article. And Muslims sometimes quote that, saying that modern in the modern era, Muslims are a bit like uh, Jews in the time of Jesus. In what sense? Muslims believe, we Muslims believe we're God's chosen people. We have the true religion. But there is this foreign civilization called Rome that has come and occupied you, right? It sometimes appointed uh, subservient dictators to Roman interests. Yeah. And he, this is, this is a, just a trauma, historical trauma. And Toynbee says in his famous article, I think 1940s he wrote this. He says, when civilizations face a challenge like, the, like this, especially civilizations like Islam and Judaism, which are civilizations who believe that they rep represent God's truth, they develop two extreme responses. One is um, Hero Herodianism, like be exactly like the Romans, imitate their ways, uh, have hat laws that you put on people. So like Ataturk, uh, and he mentions Ataturk as one uh, example of Herodianism, like, Try abandon who you are and exactly imitate what you are, what the uh, intruder is. Uh, that's not a line I support. You know, as a Turk, I should say that. And then he says the other one is zealot, zealotism or zealotry, 
And that is be so strict in your observance of the law, fight the enemy, uh, just be militant in your understanding. And he's, he sees these as two extremes. Now, I think this very much represents <laughs> our reality in the modern world today, indeed. We have uh, Muslims who, because of the Western, like Rome, and also Roman hegemony, let's not forget, was not just political, but also cultural. Hellenism was a very powerful influence. And I think this has led in the Muslim world to some authoritarian regimes or some self-hating Muslims who want to abandon who they are and exactly be like the Romans, you know. Uh, and actually, by the way, at the t at, at modern West at least has some democracy and liberalism that the Romans didn't have, but anyway. Uh, but then this other approach, which is zealotry, which is uh, be incredibly strict and uncompromising and, and uh, establish theocracies and fights and, you know, with arms and everything. Uh, and that line, by the way, uh, the term theocracy is used by Joseph, Josephus, a uh, Jewish historian, as the ideal of the groups who are fighting the Roman occupation. And these zealots were willing to establish a theocracy. And some of them also engaged in terrorism. They were called Sicari. They were using daggers to uh, insult people. Now, I see historically as Jesus, Isa al Messiah, as a Jew, a pious Jew, a prophet to the Jews, who mm -hmm. represented a third way. And uh -huh. that third way was neither subservience to Rome and uh, buying into Roman ideas and, and Roman beliefs. Um, not, not abandoning his fate, but also criticizing attitudes within Judaism, which was forgetting the spirit, forgetting the spirit of the law, and focusing on rigid implementation of the law. So he called on fellow uh, Jews of his time to revive their tradition, but also reform some of their ways, so that the halakha actually represents the moral ideals it is supposed to. Uh, that's why he was a Jewish reformist. He was not subservient to Rome. He was not a fanatic that is fighting a war for establishing a theocracy. And he was uh, 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 he was representing a third line. There, therefore, for example, I find some of the criticism we see in the New Testament from Jesus to rigid literalists of his day as relevant. And I see that uh, criticism quite pertinent. Uh, to some things I see in the Muslim world today. So, so what we can learn from Jesus is that when we are in a situation like his time, uh, the right sunnah is neither uh, self-denial and, and uh, imitationism nor fanaticism and uh, rigid literalism. It's rather healing ourselves and uh, improving our own spiritual state. Mm. I, I, I agree. I, I've noticed uh, as well in my own reading of the early history of Judaism, these different uh, sects uh, or parties. Uh, Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, you mentioned himself was uh, a commander, a general actually, in the revolt against Rome, uh, which led to the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in AD 70. And then when he was captured, he went over to the Roman side and became the darling of the Roman elite and uh, produced his famous works. Um, but you mentioned the zealots, you mentioned the, uh, the those that uh, the terrorists, the quasi terrorists who went around stabbing people. Then you didn't mention the uh, the Dead Sea, the producers of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Qumran community, but there were another the response yeah. to the Essenes, who, people who retreated from the impurity of the, the temple cult in Jerusalem and uh, yeah. sought a, a, a much purer, refined um, faith. The Sadducees, another bunch who were the, apparently the in control of the temple and they were seen as like the Herodians in a sense they were seen as colluders with the occupying forces and then you get the poor Pharisees who who are the whipping boy I, I say the poor Pharisees because I, I, my suspicion is that they're given a bit of a bad press in um, Christianity and indeed the very word Pharisee now is in our dictionaries meaning someone who is legalistic and uh, you know lacking compassion and so on but I, I, I'm, I'm persuaded by historic Jewish historians like Giza Vermish, for example, uh, who was himself Jewish, um, that there's a bit of typecasting going on here. And there were many Pharisees who did actually, were very, they were very popular with the Jewish people, actually. They weren't seen as uh, people to avoid and not invite around for dinner. These were 
uh, a very, very popular kind of revival movement, uh, but not political, perhaps not re not insurrectionist, not not terribly um, keen on the Romans either, but just kind of practicing their piety. But maybe there, there were in, maybe there is some truth, as you say, in, in the Gospels that they were they had a reputation, some of them, for being overly legalistic. Um, but I think there's the one point I might disagree with you on there about the understanding of Jesus, and this is all conjecture because we have different portraits of Jesus in the Gospels. Matthew's portrait is of a Jewish Jesus compared to, say, I don't know, Mark or John, who was a very un-Jewish in some ways Jesus. Uh, but in Matthew anyway, Jesus, when it comes to, uh, say, sexual morality, when it comes to marriage, divorce, pornea, the Greek word for immorality, is actually quite even more... Um, uh, con conservative um, than uh, the more liberal Jewish thinking on these uh, subjects. So his his fiqh, if you like, in Sharia terms, would be more uh, 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 on the conservative side than the more liberal. If we take Matthew's Jesus as somehow historical, and I know it's a huge if, and you may disagree, of course, but M Mark has a very different understanding where, G uh, well, on sexual morality in Mark 10, Jesus is made to say, you know, uh, you know, divorce is basically prohibited now. And that, you know, man and woman have made one flesh and what God has bound together, let no man, you know, pull asunder. So he's even more conservative. So that kind of pours against the more liberalizing, compassionate, loving Jesus. But on the other hand, he, he's also that as well, as we see in his encounter well, with the poor and women and prostitutes and so on. So I, I don't really have a, an explanation for that. Uh, well, that depends on what we mean the term liberal, right? I mean, I, uh, yeah, let yeah. me begin the first point you made. It, you're right. And why, I mean, is, was Jesus really that much against the Pharisees and, or is this something that is projected onto Jesus by, by later gospel writers who actually yeah. thought that the Pharisees are bad people in the eyes of Rome? So let's make sure that Jesus is the wrath of Jesus is directed to the Pharisees. So let's make sure that we are safe, you know, in the eyes. Yeah, now, that's, the theory, yeah. that's possible. So, I mean, it is possible that the people that Ju Jesus were criticizing maybe were not the Pharisees, but maybe the Sadducees, maybe the Herodians, maybe little, you know, words have been replaced there and so on and so forth. These are all possible. But I see a strong tendency to criticize dry legalism and arrogance built upon that. Yeah, there is a moral message there. I mean, who those people were, maybe they were not exactly the Pharisees, or maybe they were just one group of Pharisees. And and this was this was emphasized a lot because criticizing Pharisees would go well in the eyes of the Roman authorities. So there is yeah. maybe there is a layer, additional layer there. But on the other hand, I don't think that whole idea of criticizing um, arrogance, hypocrisy that is built around literalism, uh, I think there is some moral message there, which I think see as genuine. Now, no. one thing, uh, and this brings us to the broader issue of, I mean, I, I speak about liberalism, liberty, and so on and so forth. Um, this is not about, I mean, to me, liberalism is not a philosophy that let everybody commit all the sins and that's wonderful and let's applaud that. I mean, it's not that. It's about how do you approach society? You, of course, at any religious uh, pi piety, any piety, any any religiosity, from our perspective, will preach against immorality. Will will advise and preach for a traditional way of life, a family life, and that that that's the liberalism I would be espousing. I mean, in in, in context to this discussion, isn't anything against against that. The question is, what do you do to people who are not exactly not on that level? Do you stone them or do you still show compassion to them? And I think the stoning issue there, right. uh, very famous, you know, uh, uh, Jesus stops these men from stoning a woman who's become, uh, who has uh, committed adult adultery, but she was an unfortunate woman and the men who were going to stone her were also arrogant, uh, uncompromising uh, bigots. And, so uh, the kind of message of Jesus I see is somebody who, on the one hand, calls on Jews to be religious and pious and uh, very austere in their uh, life. And, of course, 
be uh, moral, including sexual morality, but also at the same time criticizes uh, rigidity, criticizes obsessing about the minutia of law rather than the spirit of the law. Uh, he criticizes clergy that admonishes other people all the time and take an arrogant pride in doing that. I'd see those dynamics in, in our ummah today. So I think that's relevant. I, I think that I, I think I agree with most of uh, what you say there in terms of the spiritual diseases of, of the heart. Uh, absolutely. I, I would, I mean, I'm not being entirely devil's advocate here. I, I would query your characterization of Jesus' attitude towards stoning there. I just do two, two observations. One, the passage you refer to is in the Gospel of John, chapters seven and seven and eight. And um, it is now understood by textual critics not to be part of the Gospel of John originally. It was added by unknown scribes at a later date. We know this because, for example, it's, it's not that story of the woman caught in adultery, uh, who Jesus said, you know, go and sin no more, and people fell away and he, she wasn't stoned, um, is not found in the earliest manuscripts, say the Codex Sinaiticus in the British Library, for example, or the Codex Vaticanus in Rome. And it's not quoted by any of the early church fathers either, which was quite surprising if it was such an extremely interesting story. That's the first point. It is of questionable provenance. We don't know if it's historical or not, uh, although it is it is in all the Bibles, but uh, although it's not actually part of the original gospel. If you look at this uh, NRSV, which is the standard academic scholarly translation used in English, uh, you'll see a footnote at the bottom of the page saying that this story is not in the earliest manuscripts. That's my first point. The second point is to actually refer to stories where he does advocate the death penalty and where there isn't any textual issues. For example, in Matthew chapter 15, um, where the Pharisees and the scribes go to Jesus, you know, and criticize him for, uh, you know, they break, they're breaking the tradition by not washing their hands before they eat. And Jesus answered them, this is Matthew 15, saying, and why did you break the commandment of God? So he's addressing the Pharisees and the scribes here. Why did you break the commandment of God? for the sake of your tradition, for God said, honor your father and mother. So he's quoting there from one of the 10 commandments. They broke that, they ignored that. And, and this is the second one, whoever speaks evil of father or mother must surely die. Um, now that's actually a quote from two play, Leviticus and uh, Deuteronomy, where uh, a person, say a, a young person who curses their parents or speaks very ill of them, is commanded to ex is the, the command is to execute that person literally to kill them whether it's by stoning i don't know but it could well be um the point is in, in matthew's version jesus is not a liberal he's someone who upholds laws that we today in the west or probably anywhere would consider to be totally barbaric and indeed unchristian this is the irony um whereas we would look to john 7 and 8 which is actually ironically uh, according to the textual critics, Bart Ehrman, Brutz, Metzger, and so on, would say it was never part of the original gospel at all. And indeed, it's a, a produce of a, a later scribal Christian tradition. So that, that, there'll be my caveats about what you've said. That the, the danger here that we create G, perhaps Jesus in our own image to the extent that is not uh, in totally found in the, at least the Christian sources, anyway. Well, uh, well, it points, when he says that person will die, I don't know whether it's, it's necessarily calling for the execution of the penalty there. I mean, I think that's a matter of interpretation there, right? Uh, he's actually quoting um, the, he's actually quoting uh, from the Leviticus. Ten Commandments. Uh, no, 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 no the, the commandment about the uh, honor your father and mother is from the Ten Commandments. But the commandment, uh, it says, he answered them, and why do you break the commandments of God for the sake of tradition? And he quotes, honor your father and mother, Ten Commandments, and then whoever speaks evil of father or mother must surely die. So the, the, the implication is the Pharisees have failed to implement these two commandments, uh, one of which is to kill someone who speaks. So if you've got a rowdy teenager. Now, I'm not saying I support this law. Don't get me wrong. I'm not advocating for this law. I, I'm just saying it's a matter of historical record. If Matthew is right, then... Uh, this is a fly in the ointment. It doesn't quite fit. Well, uh, I'll look into that passage. I mean, I didn't look into how that passage has been interpreted in different ways. Uh, and I'm not uh, against the idea that, I mean, Jesus was a halakhic Jew. And for certainly, I mean, he probably upheld the Ten Commandments and reminded them those. Uh, but just reading plain, uh, for example, that passage could be understood as 
as what some Muslims are saying about the Sharia today, that these mm. upper, these hudud are just reminders of how stark these uh, crimes are, but maybe they should be implemented in a more lenient way compared to what some people are implementing them today. So again, I'm not uh, saying that he would go against the, shari uh, the halakha at the time. He, uh, we have passages of him uh, criticizing literalists for being, you know, opposing things on the Sabbath, but you know, he uh, saving a person in the Sabbath. So he is criticizing some mindless literalism. And, and spritless, I think, literally. Oh, yeah. no, I, I, I don't disagree with that. It's just, uh, I think in, in Matthew's version of the story, uh, Matthew 23, 23, where Jesus teaches uh, the crowds to, uh, you know, he says, the, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it, but do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they preach. I mean, the, the Pharisees would teach uh, the law teachers to execute adulterers, for example. Um, what, is, I, yeah. what is important to me there from what we can learn from Jesus' discussion mm -hmm. is Jesus was, uh, Jesus was a prophet sent to Jews at a time when they were occupied by Rome. But when we look into his teachings, and those could be tailored, it's possible, you know, by later comers to make it docile to Rome. But he doesn't come up like this. We're just fighting the Roman imperialists by all means necessary, and that's our liberation, and that's it. You know, that's kind of the Jesus as a guerrilla leader. Yeah. I mean, actually, my friend Reza wrote a book, uh, The Zealot, and yes. the, the, I, I respect Reza's scholarship, but th that's not what I agree with. I mean, I don't agree with that line. And, and if Jesus was just a Jewish freedom fighter, uh, a anti-occupation uh, resistance figure, we wouldn't know about him today. I mean, there are other people like Bar Chokhba, a lot of people who, you know, fight. I'm not saying resisting occupation is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, I'm not against that, but, but what I'm saying, he said something else. He said something spiritual to the Jews of his time. Yeah. And uh, that was, the Quran also says he was uh, actually making the halakha less strict. I mean, I, I can't now paraphrase the word exactly to you, but there is a verse in the Quran that he is lifting the heavy weights that were on them. So he was, uh, uh, I have to look into the words exactly to quote yeah, it. It says the, the, some, some of the law was, was lifted from them, which had been there in a sense, to, uh, almost like a punishment. Uh, and he lifted that from them. Um, yeah. So he true. was a reformist in that sense and, and uh, God's given reformist to Jews. So, I think the very fact that he was speaking about things like that at a time of Roman supremacy and occupation without not buying into that uh, mm -hmm. is, I think, an interesting balance. And I think today, because I see uh, all these, I see both Herodians in the Muslim world, I see both the Zealots, and I think both these uh, directions are not the right direction. And in, in Jesus, in the historical mission of Jesus, besides all the theology, I see this very interesting insight, a sunnah yeah. that can be relevant to our day and age. I, I think, I think the, my takeaway from this, what, what you said is extremely important. That, uh, and I've noticed as well, when you look back at the first century, particularly in Judaism, in its context of the Roman world, and the, the different responses that Jewish people, uh, rabbis, ordinary folk had to the occupation by Rome, and the fact that Israel was not in control of its destiny, there wasn't a king on the throne like David, and, and you do get these four or five different reactions, which are so similar to the reactions you get from Muslim state. Everything from violent extremism, jihadism on the one hand, to, uh, I don't know, a, a kind of what you call Herodianism. Herodianism, a, yeah. A, a sycophantic, westernized uh, Islam, which, bears, which is totally at home in, in uh, London, Washington, Paris, whatever. Uh, and, uh, and and all, all the grades in between, you know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Essenes who withdrew from the community, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I found that really helpful because it's kind of a, a, a an historical map where we're not personally involved with Judaism in that sense, but actually the dynamics of this historical, spiritual, cultural, political dynamics are incredibly similar to what's facing the Ummah today in the world, where, where it is under occupation in some places, 
and it is facing the hegemony of the West, the, the Hellenization, if you like, uh, the, the hegemony of the West to conform to Hellenistic values, just to mix it all up for a second, uh, whether it be about sexuality or, or about all sorts of things. Um, so I think your, your, your core observation is really interesting. And I think we, there is much that the Jesus we, we see uh, that can teach us about compassion and mercy and, and putting uh, people, you know, understanding the Sharia is there to help us live as good, uh, wholesome people and not to burden us, to mm -hmm. crush us with legalism. Mm -hmm. so I think your point is well taken. Thank you so much. Just one nuance I would add there. I mean, you mentioned being at home in London and elsewhere. Um, yeah. rhetoric. I think there's no problem with that. Uh, the problem would be being a Herodian, which is not being able to practice your Judaism in a Roman territory if it was allowed at the time. It's yeah. about aiding and collaborating with the brutal Roman occupation. So the hated people are the tax people, you know, that collect tax in the name of Rome. So that is yeah. different being given the right to be a Jew in the city of Rome at the time. And if you were a pious Jew living freely in Rome, by the way, the Romans probably wouldn't have that much religious freedom. So it's not comparable for today. So that's why I don't, I mean, there are differences. So Rome was uh, not the same thing with a modern liberal society. No. But um, uh, I think the key there, Herodianism that I'm criticizing is, has two aspects. One is aiding and promoting and helping a brutal occupation of your own people. Second, uh, also imitating its ways in the way that it violates who you are, right? Uh, help, being a Hellenistic in the ways that just you, def you abandon your Jewishness. Uh, mm -hmm. and even you impose that on others as, as Herodians in our day and age did in, in, in my country, Turkey, or in Iran under the Shah, for example. We've seen rulers coming and banning hijab, right? So they are the kind of Herodians in my mind. If you wear a hijab freely and practice your religion in London, uh, that's that, there's nothing wrong. See, I, I'm in France here, and uh, well, uh, we have a problem with France. Yeah, <laughs> I cannot practice their faith and live modestly if they're a teacher. Even if you're taking your kid out on a school trip, I learned the other day, uh, Muslim women have to remove their hijab, or they they will be refused to. You know, and working in in the state, uh, a whole range of things you can't do. And but practice very different in Britain, by the way, where all and in America where all this is perfectly legal. Yeah, that's why uh, I've been a very big critique, <laughs> critic of French secularism, laïcité, uh, and its uh, unfortunate implementations in the Muslim world, in, in Turkey and Tunisia. Uh, but I would also call on fellow Muslims to see that, well, that is actually not very liberal, and that's the problem, that's not liberalism. And France is in a sufficiently liberal country, and that's why we have these uh, unacceptable limitations on religious freedom, religious freedom of Muslims, Jews, anybody. Absolutely. Well, perhaps we draw to a, a close now. And um, uh, before I sign off, Mustafa, is there anything you wanted to say in conclusion about your book or anything you've said so far today? Well, Paul, thank you so much. It's really great to discuss this. Uh, this book has been published in 2017, like almost uh, more, more than four years ago. Uh, but I, I see people growingly more and more interested in this. Uh, thank you for the videos you, you actually made on this book. I would recommend people to go check them as well. Uh, and uh, most of the book is about theology, but at the end, it comes to some of the relevant contemporary issues in Islam as well. We need to discuss those issues too. Just thank you. If people are interested in reading the book, they can go probably find it on Amazon and some bookstores. Oh, I'll, I'll link to it. Uh, don't worry. Okay. Uh, I always do. Uh, it, but it, I, I do say, I mean, I, I kind of read a bit on, on this subject over the years, and it is an excellent resource in one book form uh, for Muslims and for others wishing to understand how uh, Jesus is viewed in Islam. So it actually... It's, it's a good book for everyone, not just for Muslims. Yeah. Who and I should say, a lot of Christians, I mean, I've read so many Christians who read the book and deeply appreciated it. Some of them, especially on the more conservative side, you know, were a little critical of a little uh, on the very fact that I criticize, of course, uh, the doctrine of Trinity. Uh, but they still, even those uh, figures said, this is a fair book and, you know, respectful to the Christian tradition as well. I didn't write this book to, like, criticize Christianity or, uh, or but but to say that 
you know what? We are one big Abrahamic monotheistic tree, and these branches go in different ways, which we never thought before. And and one one deep uh, message is that is that we 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 being Muslims, Jews and Christians, we are so deeply connected. Yeah. And 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 when we read our texts, oh, what you read in the Quran can one thing. I mean, letter of James that was like amazing to me when I read it 20 years ago. He says, never say you will go to this village and do this the next day. I said, oh my God, this is the Quran. This is Surah Al-Kaf. Like, exactly. The same uh, divine, in my belief, teaching just manifests itself in, in different parts of the world, in Galilee, in Mecca, in, in somewhere, in, in, uh, in Jerusalem. And, and we are all heirs to that tradition. Uh, and I think uh, our differences are there. But the bottom line is that we should respect each other and keep learning from each other. Oh, so a very, a very good conclusion there. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mustafa Akio, for your time. And I'm not going to uh, mention your book again because I've done so too much already. But I, I will link to it beneath. Uh, and also, by the way, ha have a look at the letter of James in the New Testament. You can Google it very easily. It's a short letter, uh, yeah. particularly Muslims, by the way. Have a read of it and see what you think. As Muslims, when you read this letter of James in the Bible, uh, this short letter, and let me know what you think of it. Uh, is it something you can identify with? Is there anything you disagree with in the letter? Um, uh, because it's a fascinating read. Um, and that's the book, that's the letter I think that got Mustafa going on this long journey that led to this book and even to this interview. So thank you very much indeed. And um, thank you. And I'll, I'll, thank I'll be you, making, Paul. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye for now. Take care. Until next.